of Saul came out to meet him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. David said to Michelle, it was before the Lord, watch this, who chose me, number one, rather than your father or anyone else from this house, when he, number two, appointed me ruler over the Lord's people or Israel. Watch this. I will celebrate before the Lord. In other words, what I did was not for you. It was for the Lord. And then he says our key verse. If you think that was something, I will become even more undignified than this. And I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. By these slave girls and uh, uh, who, who you talking about, who you said I was humiliated in front of, I will become even more undignified than this. For the time that we share, I like to lift this subject. You've been warned. You've been warned. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we are so grateful to you for this moment of preaching and teaching and exalting your people. Will you please send the true speaker because if he does not come, James J. Bolton will have to take his seat. It's in the matchless name of Jesus we pray. With our sins forgiven, we ask. Amen. You've been warned. Dear hearts, there is nothing like the presence of God. You can search the world over and go to places like the beautiful scene of Bora Bora the captivating images of the Grand Canyon and the wonderful waters of the Bahamas. But no place compares to being in God's presence. Once you have experienced the true essence of his genuine glory, once you have experienced that, you cannot wait until the opportunity comes to get back there. It's sort of a sign of a positive addiction. Once you taste it, you are desiring to taste it again. And I am not talking about goosebumps. I'm talking about the true essence of God's presence. Our subject mentioned today, David, had given and had experienced a glimpse of God's presence. David knew all too well what it felt like to be where God was. David understood the lovely atmosphere that God's presence would bring. And back in David's day, there was a representation, a representational location or place of God's presence. This particular representation this particular place was a box or a chest that was approximately three feet long, approximately two and a half feet wide, and approximately two feet three inches high. This representation of God's central presence was in a chest 
or a box that was covered with a lid known as the mercy seat. Inside of this box or this chest that was approximately three feet, nine inches long were three main things. The first thing that was in this box were the tablets of law. The second thing in the box was a jar of manna. And the third thing in this box was Aaron's rod. Some people of that day called this box or this chest that represented, represented God's presence. Some called it the Ark of God. Others in that day and historians and biblical theologians have also called it the Ark of Testimony. But we commonly know it as the Ark of the Covenant. This box, this Ark, was commissioned to be built approximately 400 years before David's time. For this Ark, this box, this chest, provided a central place, a central location for God's presence a central location for God's presence. And when the presence of God was not there, the presence of God was missed from being there. So David wrote in the 16th number of Psalm, verse 11, in reference to the presence of God, he said this, in thy presence, is fullness of joy, and at their right hand are pleasures forevermore. But chapters before the one we got in tonight, today, we realize that the presence, the ark of the covenant is gone. The presence of God in a human sense, dear hearts, have been, has been stolen by the Philistines. And they had the presence, the ark, stolen with them for such a long time that when David, who had defeated a main Philistine, 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 however you want to call it, realized where the ark was, he said, I'm going back to retrieve the ark from these uncircumcised Philistines and I'm going to bring it to the proper place where it belongs. Prior to the chapter in which we are reading 2 Samuel, the last time we'd seen the ark was in 1 Samuel chapter 7 verse 1 when the Philistines had to give it up and it was hanging out at a guy by the name of Abinadad's house. Abinadad had the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant, hanging out at his house for approximately 20 years. And David realized where the Ark, where the presence was, and he wanted to return it back to Jerusalem or the city of David. Now, Abinadad had a son named Eleazar, and Eleazar was charged with the help of two gentlemen by the name of Ahio and Uzzah to guard over the ark. And when they were guarding over the ark and they heard that David and a coalition were going to come and retrieve the ark, the ark was then moved. The ark, which the Philistines had carried on a cart, was now being moved by David and his army. Now the Philistines kept the ark on a cart but the ark was never designed to be carried on a cart. The Philistines were not God's chosen people, so they treated his presence with disrespect. But the chosen people decided they were going to carry the ark like the Philistines did. 
And that's a word to us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot do and operate like the world. We must do and operate like God instructed us. I told you some years ago, I was in graduate school and I was driving home and a lot of my friends were not in school and they were doing what they wanted to do. And I said, God, can I just have a day that I could just let my hair down? I just don't, I don't want to be holy. I don't want to be righteous. I'm not saying I want to do anything wrong. I just want to be normal. And as, as I was turning Brother David into my apartment complex, the Lord spoke clearly to me. And he says, that's what they do. If you do it, I'll kill you. I did not know if it was going to be a physical death, a spiritual death, or a mental death. I just realized I did not want to commit suicide that day. Because God, when he calls you, he also chooses you and he chooses you to be different from the world. So at that particular time, I had to come to the realization that as a man of God, I could not do what the world did. And David and his posse chose to carry the ark like the Philistines and that was a bad decision. You do not, Donetrius, you do not operate like the world. The ark of God represents his presence. Therefore, the ark of God, you do not hitch the ark of God to a cart. You attach the ark of God to your heart. Did you hear me? The ark is not supposed to be on a cart. The ark is supposed to be in your heart. So what happens is David, along with Ahio or Ahio and Uzziah, decide to carry the ark like the uncircumcised Philistines did. And when they did this, they took a few steps and the ark that was carried on the cart started to fall. Did you hear me? The ark that was carried on the cart decided or started to fall, Brother Tyrese. The ark, the presence of God that was hitched on a cart started to fall. And Uzzah, who had been around God's presence for 20 years, he decided that as the ark was falling, that he would retch out, not reach, he would retch out and catch the ark from falling. But here's what happened. The moment he retched out and kept the ark from falling, he fell dead. As I had been around the presence of God long enough to realize that it is not his responsibility to keep God from falling. It is God's responsibility to keep him from falling. God don't need your help being God. You need God's help being you. So that's why Jude says now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless. You can't present God faultless and you can't stop God from falling. So as he touches the ark, he falls dead because he tried to do too much. Realizing what First Chronicles 15 says and Numbers chapter 15 verse 4 says that ye shall not touch the holy thing lest ye die. So Uzzah trying to do the right thing made the wrong decision. And we see here now that death does not come from God's heart. Death is a result of man's disobedience. So up until this point, dear hearts, David was happy to regain the presence of God. But as he sees Uzzah die from touching the ark, he gets upset. Not only, Brother David, does he get upset, but he also becomes fearful. 
And he says, I'm not taking the ark, the presence back to Jerusalem. I'm going to take it or have it delivered to a guy by the name of Obed Edom. So David, after this man dies in his face, he delivers the ark to Obed Edom's house. And he goes back, David, that is, to the city of David or Jerusalem, sad, fearful, and afraid. But as the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, mama, is at Obed Edom's house, it is there for 90 days. And the word gets back in that particular three months to David that Obed Edom's house and everyone that's associated with him is being blessed because the presence is present. David hears that as long as God's presence is at or hanging out at Obed Edom's house, everybody associated with Obed Edom is being blessed. That's what we see in the 23rd Psalms. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He making me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me to the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thou rod and thy staff. They comfort me, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou, watch this, anointed my head with oil, you my cup runneth over. So everything that's in the cup is going to get to the saucer. So Obed Edom is the cup. The people around him is the saucer because the presence of God is so much it blesses him and everyone associated with him. So David who first feared God's presence. Now he wants the favor of God's presence. So this time, Brother Renee, he strikes out to go get the presence of God in the person of the ark again. But this time, it's a bit different. The Bible says that as they went back to retrieve the ark from Obed Edom's house, that they took six steps as they now held the ark correctly. They took six steps and then they delivered or they made sacrifices unto the Lord. Now, some Bible believers think that or believe that they took the ark and for every six steps that they made two sacrifices. Now, that sounds good and I can understand why they said that, but that's highly unlikely because from where the ark was, it would have taken them a long time to simply take six steps and offer two sacrifices. What most theologians believe is that they actually took the ark, took six steps, and made three sacrifices. This is what I believe. They took six steps, then made three sacrifices. The Bible says the two sacrifices that were made, number one was for a ox. The second sacrifice was a fatling. But if you look very carefully, there's a third sacrifice. The third sacrifice is actually the sacrifice of praise. That's what the Bible calls praise. They call the Bible calls praise a sacrifice. So what really happened is as they took those six steps, that was actually the number of steps that Uzzah had taken before the ark started falling. So what they realized is when they took the six steps and God did not kill them or do away with them, they felt that they owe God a sacrifice. The ox was for peace. The fatling was for fellowship. But the third sacrifice of praise was for appreciation. God, I don't deserve for your presence to be near me, but since it is near me, I'm not just going to offer a peace offering. I'm not just going to offer a fellowship offering. 
I, after these six steps of being alive, I owe you a praise. So David and his crew, the Bible says, danced. And as they are dancing, David has on an ephod linen. Now understand this, dear hearts, the ephod was reserved for a priest. David, excuse my language, ain't no priest. David is a king. But the Bible tells us that many are called, yet few are chosen. Hear me, hear me. My calling is a scientific molecular biologist. That's what I'm called to do. But what God chose me to do is to preach. So there's a difference between appointing and anointing. Appointing is what you do. An anointing is what God gives you the power to do. So David, as he is appreciating God that he ain't dead, that he's still alive after carrying this ark for six steps, decides, Auntie Beverly, that he owe God a praise. And his praise led him to a point where he did not just dance, but the Bible says that he danced to the point, the king danced to the point that he's half naked. But in the meantime, and in between time, his wife, Michelle, hears and sees the ruckus that's going on outside. And she looks and sees King David, King David, dancing among slave women. Or King David dancing among common people. A king ain't supposed to act like that. So she humiliates him and tells him, you have humiliated yourself. Now, let me pause, put a pause pen in this and throw this right here. One of the saddest things you can experience is when someone criticizes your praise. But the saddest experience is when the person who criticizes your praise knows your story. Michelle should have known all of the stuff that God had brought David out of. She is his wife. And there's nobody too many times that knows you better than the person that you live with. And so here it is where Michelle criticizes David for how he's behaving before the Lord. And that's why when I was growing up, I will see people in our church many times or in any church when somebody gets the Holy Ghost that they would go and fan them and go and fan them. And I told myself years ago, when look, if I get happy, don't nobody come and fan my fire. Before I got to church, I asked the Lord to catch me on fire. So don't come and fan me, baby. Come and get next to me so, so some of this fire that I got can burn on you too. So don't don't fan Bolton when he get happy. Don't come in here with no Martin Luther King fan and try to fan out my flame. I asked God to touch me. And David. David. Who knew all too well. He wanted God to touch him. He desired God's presence. And it is super duper sad that Michelle would criticize his praise. And it shows us something, dear heart. David's wife, Michelle, criticized his praise. And it shows us this, that everybody who's by your side is not necessarily on your side. Tweet that. But David comes with three quick things in his response to Michelle, who tells David it just didn't take all of that. You don't know what it took. You're not me. You weren't, you don't know where you don't, 
You don't know what God has done for me. And to be by my side and yet on my side, yet criticizes my praise. I got something to tell you, Michelle. The first thing I'm going to say, Michelle, I'm behaving this way. Number one, because God approves my presence. God approves my presence. Michelle, you said don't take all of that. Let me tell you something. It wasn't for you no way. The Bible says that David says this was unto the Lord because he chose me when others should have been chosen. He chose me knowing everything about me that he knows. He still chose me. God approves my presence. And that's why the 100 number Psalm says make a joyful noise. Watch this unto the Lord. Not unto people, but unto the Lord, because when he chooses you, he was the one who chose to wake you up this morning. He was the one who chose to start you on your way. He was the one who chose to save you. Now, Michelle, when you wake me up in the morning, when you start me on my way, I would choose to do what you say. But until then. I can behave this way because God chose me. He approves my presence. Not only does he approve my presence, but number two, the reason I'm behaving this way, and you can tell people this when they criticize your praise. Number two, not only does he what? Approve my presence, but number two, he appoints my purpose. The Bible says that before I formed you in the belly, I knew thee. I sanctified thee before there was a when or a where I knew what I wanted you to do. And part, dear hearts, of our purpose is to praise. That's why Psalm 23, uh, 22, 3 says the Lord inhabits the praise of his people. Now, don't go too fast. God inhabits the purpose of your existence partly is to praise. Why? Because God inhabits the praise of his people. Now he inhabits, he dwells in, he lives in. So stop saying that statement. When praises go up, the blessings come down. You should actually be saying when praises go up, the blesser comes down. For he inhabits the praises of his people. And we see in Isaiah chapter 38 that Hezekiah, when the prophet Isaiah said that he was going to die, Hezekiah said, Lord, if you if I die, the grave can't praise you. So praise actually changes your life. Praise changes your life. Third and finally, not only do we see that David and me and you too should behave this way because God approves your presence. Not only does he approve your presence, but God also appoints your purpose. But Mike, Michelle, and to all of the Michelles of this world, the reason why I could behave this way is because number three, God accepts my praise. God who has the adulation of the seraphims and cherubims includes you in praise. No wonder the Bible says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. So David says, although I'm a king, there's a king of kings who I'm just perfect in a few ways. But the king of king is perfect in all of his ways. So my prominence does not keep me from praising him. And Michelle, if you think this something, you've been warned because it can get worse than this. Some years ago, after I finished my Ph.D., I joined a church there in Atlanta and the church has about 15, 20,000 people. The church itself sits about seven, eight thousand seats. And I was sitting there in worship and. The presence of God came in and started reminding me of the stuff he brought me through. Well, that Sunday that the, the pastor had introduced me as Dr. Bolton, and he said, I'm so glad he's here. Well, after he said that, the, 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 the service got so good, and I did not know how to respond exactly, so I took off running. And this is a church with 7,800 seats in it. I made the first lap 
around that church and I could see people pointing at me laughing. Look at the doctor running. Look how he behaving. Look at how he behaving. I ain't no doctor supposed to be running around a church like that. I saw them pointing and laughing at me. And the more they pointed and laughed, I got a second and third win and I kept running. And I kept running. I thank you for your mighty accent. I thank you for your excellent greatness. I kept running until just all of the energy was out of me. Two Sundays later, the same two of the guys, two of the same people that were laughing at me had to escort me on the stage because God had it where I won or I was awarded the Living Legend Award. And the, the, the laughers actually became the escorts. So they were laughing at my praise, but my praise ran me into something I did not deserve. I was a PhD. The Lord had blessed me to get to that point, and I decided to praise him. I didn't care about the PhD. I didn't care about matriculating through the schools that I had been through. All I cared about was giving God some praise for accepting me even in my mess ups. I became like David, even more undignified. I lost my dignity the same way that Helen Warren did. Helen Warren from Chicago, Illinois, was the right-hand lady of the late, great Dr. Clay Evans. She, she was a woman who, when she walked into a room, she commanded the attention of everybody in that room. Helen Warren was such an astute and intelligent, and she still is, woman of God, that when you would see her, there was just something about her presence that commanded your attention. Her, her, her nails were always done. There was never a hair follicle that was out of place. When she would walk into the room, her, 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 her aroma would fill the room. She had very, very nice jewelry on and the best of clothes. And when she would talk, she talked so correctly and so proper. And when she would worship in church, when worship would be going on sometimes, I would look around for Helen Warren and Helen would be sitting there nodding her head and all of these people just worshiping and falling all out and running around the church and Helen Warren would do this and sometimes she would say amen. Nothing wrong with what she was done doing but she was a dignitary, a big wig in the church. Well, one Sunday, Pastor Father Charles G. Hayes came to the church and the choir started singing a song by the, with this, this lady named Sharon, started singing a song, Is He Satisfied With Me? And in the back of the church, I look to see because everybody else in the church seemed to be worshiping God and praising and thanking him for what he's done. And Helen Warren let out a shout. Woo! Helen, the dignitary, let that shout out. And when she let that shout out, so many people started looking at her because they knew he Helen Warren ain't supposed to act like that. Well, she let out another shout. Woo! And certain people started going towards where Helen Warren was. The shout was just a warning. Because when they got to where Helen Warren was, Helen let it all out. Helen stretched out her hands and started screaming and shouting. And she kicked her feet to the point that she took three rows of folks with her. The pastor had to say, is that Helen behaving like that? The moment he said that, Helen even got louder. Helen's hair was messed up. The jewelry started coming off. Helen shouted out her clothes. She stretched out. Now she tried to warn them with the holler. But since that holler didn't do it, she says, you've been warned. I can become even more undignified than this. And let me stop before I have to hit something and act like Helen warned. My time is up. And I appreciate yours.